Welcome everyone and thank you so much for joining us for our first Mesa Talks of the school year. My name is Valentina and I'm the Outreach and Engagement Coordinator at Oregon Mesa. I will be introducing the event tonight, I will be introducing our panel and then facilitating the Q&A at the end. Before I begin, I want to highlight some housekeeping items. Um, so please note that the session is being recorded. And if you have technical issues during the event and you're unable to put a question in the chat or um, unmute your mic or anything, uh, remember that the recording of the session will be uploaded to Oregon Mesa's YouTube channel and you can access this talk there on our YouTube channel after tonight. Usually they go up about two to three days after the event, um, so it'll be up later this week. Our moderator will also be keeping track of the questions that you ask and making sure that you answer them. You can also use the raise hand feature and uh, raise your hand to ask a question and unmute your mic. It is totally optional to have your camera on or off um, if you would like, but you can also ask questions that way. And we will be um, filling out a feedback form at the end and we do have um, a price, an incentive price if you fill it out, we'll do a raffle. Um, so definitely stick around until the end so that we can share that link with you. And we always appreciate feedback and suggestions for other panelists. I also want to chat about our community guidelines. Um, they're pretty straightforward and I'm gonna just read them off here. They are be respectful, listen to understand, listen actively and attentively, don't be afraid to ask questions. Allow yourselves to be uncomfortable. This, that's what the space is for. And also assume positive intentions. Um, I would also like to do a land acknowledgement. So I am actually at our office right now uh, in the College of Engineering here at Portland State University. And it is... Um, obviously native land, land that belongs to the indigenous people that were here and are still here. Um, so I'm gonna read this land acknowledgement. We honor the land that we are on. Mesa's physical office is um, at Portland State University, which rests on traditional and ancestral homelands of the Multnomah, the Kathlamet, Clackamas, the Tumwater, Watlala Bands of the Chinook, the Tualatin Kalapuya, and many other indigenous nations along the Columbia River. Please join us in acknowledging the land and uplifting the future of Indigenous Oregonians. So I'm going to introduce what MESA is and also what MESA Talks is before we jump into introducing our panel. So first of all, MESA Talks was started by um, Carla uh, Cristina Barraza Lopez back in 2019 um, here at Oregon MESA. MESA is an equity program out of Portland State University and it stands for Math, Engineering, Science, Achievement. We've been working towards advancing equity in STEM since 1985. And MESA Talks was a series that Carla started back in 2019 that sought to bring together a panel of speakers to highlight topics of interest in our community. While today we're focusing on non-traditional college routes, you can look back at our YouTube channel to see conversations that range from discussing broken and inequitable systems, to talking about food access, um, to talking about issues that women face in STEM, and also most recently, the importance of uh, paid internships and how um, it is hard to access um, internships if they're unpaid. So I would like to also share with you all Oregon Mesa's mission. Oregon Mesa's mission is to provide students underrepresented in the fields of mathematics, engineering, science, and technology with the skills, knowledge, and opportunities to develop their talents, explore technology-based careers, enter college, and compete successfully in the workforce. Today, we are going to broaden what it means to enter college. Um, we have that uh, in our mission, and since the timing of when folks enter college varies greatly on the course of uh, what, what course your life takes. We really want to drive home that no path is linear and everyone's lived experience is different. I myself, I'm the proud daughter of a non-traditional student. My mother was an older college student. 
a working parent and she graduated with her bachelor's degree when I was 10 years old. I actually got to go to her graduation and it was one of the proudest moments of my life. Today, we are highlighting the voices of many non-traditional students and we are using this term non-traditional in a very broad way. We have a panel of excellent speakers who will each share a little bit about their story, and then we're going to face into a Q&A discussion where you can ask them questions. So please hold your questions until then. I'm so excited to introduce our panel. Um, we have three excellent non-traditional students, um, Zoe Erickson, Raul Preciado Mendez, and Jess Chance, and I'm going to introduce them all. I'm going to read their bio and then they're going to share a little bit about themselves and we're really going to get to hear directly from them their story. Um, so I'm going to start off by introducing our first speaker, Zoe Erickson. So Zoe is a Portland State University alum and a former non-traditional student. As an adult learner and student parent, Zoe selected Portland State University for the fact that she could pursue her education and her, have her family on campus with her. She is now a mom of two and works as program manager for the Higher Education in Prison program. She earned her undergraduate, master's, and graduate certificate from PSU and considers this learning community a home in so many ways. Zoe has worked at the university since 2016 when she began as a student staff member at the Resource Center for Students with Children. Thank you, Zoe, for joining us and take it away. Should I go ahead and introduce myself? Yeah, go ahead. <clears throat> Hello, everyone. Thank you for being here today. My name is Zoe. Um, like my bio says, I was a former non-traditional student. Um, and I kind of consider myself as existing in the in-between space because I have plans to be a student once again very soon behind the scenes. So that's the plan. Um, when I first started at Portland State, my son was 11 months old. And that was a really interesting time as a parent and just a person to try to also venture out into pursuing my college degree was not really something that I had a lot of support surrounding. Um, I'm also a first generation student. So I think that <clears throat> I felt a great deal of discomfort at first due to like all of those intersectional identities coming into play all at the very same moment. I can't say that that's happened at any specific other moment in my life. So it was unique, definitely. Um, but I just knew that I wanted to pursue my education once I became a mom and knew that I needed to, uh, you know, pursue some avenues for financial mobility to be able to support a family and be a single mom. And so that was really what made me look into Portland State. And uh, I should also share that I did not complete my high school diploma. I got my GED. So I was even on more shaky ground because I had kind of made myself believe that I wasn't the ideal student or someone that wouldn't necessarily be successful in that realm. And I think that pursuing my education just gave me an overall huge sense of confidence that I don't think any other endeavor in my life could have given me. So thank you guys for being here today with us. Thank you, Zoe. I'm going to now introduce our second panelist. We have Jess, who is a newer returning transfer student to PSU and is in the process of finishing her degree in communications after spending many years in the events industry, cultivating and managing large events in the Portland area. She joined the team at Oregon Mesa in October 2023, and she still currently works as our event support specialist. Jess has a keen interest in equity and bringing the STEM program to underrepresented youth in our area. She is especially passionate about fostering confidence in young girls in regards to mathematics. Thank you, Jess, for joining our panel and go ahead and take it away. Thank you, Valentina. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and just read my story that I've kind of written down real quick, just to kind of uh, assist me getting through it here. Uh, thanks everyone for being here. Um, I just kind of wanted to start by saying, um, 
a little bit about where I grew up. Um, I grew up in a small town in Northern Arizona where the population of this town was actually equivalent to the college that I was looking to attend in the fall. Um, I was 18 when I went to Arizona State straight out of high school, mainly because many of my family members had gone there before me. Um, other than that, I wasn't really sure why I was going. Um, but what a shock it was when I got there and I had classes with 200 students and even one with 400 in held in a huge auditorium. Um, in a way, I felt like I was just a number and I felt very small in comparison. Uh, looking back on it, I really wish I had maybe tried community college for at least a year or two, like some of my friends did, to ease more slowly into college life. Little did I know I'd end up back at community college many years later. Uh, let's see. The first two years at ASU, I did pretty average, but I had one thing really holding me back and that would be math. I had never been good at math and it actually built up quite a paralyzing fear of it. For my major, I had loosely chosen psychology, and at that time, I didn't really know what I wanted to study like many other freshmen around me. I tried twice to get through this one math course to no avail. I had always been more on the creative side, enjoying things like creative writing, anthropology, philosophy. Um, I wasn't really terrible in science, but the math aspect of it was always challenging and, and helped me back a little there, too. So since I felt like I could not make it through this math class, I saw this as a massive wall that I couldn't go around and I definitely could not make it over. Eventually my motivation to stay in school just kind of dwindled and after almost three years, I dropped out and decided I needed a change of pace and moved to Portland, Oregon. By chance, I fell into the restaurant industry right away once I moved here. On and off, I took a few PCC computer courses to stay relevant with the changing technologies, which was helpful. Um, I managed a restaurant for years, which led to actually buying a restaurant with another couple and my husband. Those seven years were probably the hardest of my life. Uh, once we got out of the restaurant, um, I decided to get involved in the events industry. I managed events for years and also worked in sales on and off. And back in those days, uh, Pre-pandemic, we were putting on huge 500-person events, you know, sometimes twice a week, and it was um, fun, but also very stressful. Um, I did love the rush and excitement of it all, but it, it did take its toll on me. The physical workload became harder as time went by, and I started to believe that it was really the only thing that I'd ever be good at. Um, one afternoon, my brother asked me if I'd have a chat with my young nephew who was considering dropping out of college after a few years there. I figured I'd have no advice for him since I did the same exact thing. But what I did tell him is how much I regretted my own decision to leave school when I was young. Driving home that afternoon, I had an amazing realization. Why do I have to keep saying I regret my decision when I can still change it? At the very least, I could figure out what it would take to try. Turns out what it would take was a remedial math class and then the actual math class I needed to move forward. I specifically took these at PCC along with other classes as I knew I would receive more attention from the instructor with less students in each class. We also worked a lot in groups, which helped me immensely too. Well, it was no short of a miracle that I received A's in both of those math classes and was on my way to Portland State. I found a great advisor and he reassured me that I hadn't lost credits and that actually losing credits is not a real thing. Once you earn the credits, they're yours, no matter how long it's been. With the help of the amazing advisory team, we mapped out together a plan that was doable for me. I could still work, but did have to move some hours around a little bit. I was very lucky to become a part of the team at Mesa, where I have learned a lot and the experience, experience has helped me to stay more involved on campus as well. Long story short, if you told me years ago that I'd be receiving my four-year degree in communications, I would have never believed you. But here I am and I couldn't be happier about my choice to go back. 
whatever your path looks like, it is your path. So don't let anyone tell you it's not right for whatever reason. If it's right for you, it's just right. Thank you. Amazing. Thank you, Jess. Can't wait to get into the Q&A and ask you all kinds of questions. You and Zoe are so inspiring. I'm so excited that you are both here. Um, and I, I am so excited also to introduce our third speaker, Raul Preciado Mendez. Um, Raul is a first generation, formerly undocumented immigrant from Mexico. He grew up in Anchorage, Alaska, where he attended the University of Alaska Anchorage and received a BA in political science. He moved to Portland in 2013 and has worked in a wide range of community organizations and government agencies, including Latino Network, the Oregon Museum of Science and Industry, Metro, and the State of Oregon. Raul obtained his master's in public policy in 2017 and is currently a policy coordinator for the Portland Housing Bureau. Thank you, Raul, for joining us, and I can't wait to hear what you have to say. Thanks, Valentina. And yeah, I mean, I think um, it's incredible to hear the stories from Zoe and Jess. It's, uh, it's great to be among such good company. And thank you all for being here and for having me. Um, I will try to keep it somewhat short here. Uh, you can go ahead and go to the next slide. I, I chose to sort of put um, some slides of the places that I've lived. Uh, I will try to avoid going through my full life story. I kind of wrote it all out and then looked at my full life story. I was like, this is probably going to put everyone to sleep. So I feel like I'll try and just hit the highlights here. Um, I was born in Mexico. Um, my both my parents went to college but did not graduate um and uh moved to the united states to uh because they're having issues with issues with their marriage um they decided to move to alaska to fix that which uh pro tip if you're ever struggling with your marriage don't move to alaska to try and fix it it does not work uh you can go ahead and go to the next slide please um, I, uh, this, I grew up in Anchorage. This is Anchorage, Alaska. For those of you who have not been, uh, it's a very beautiful place. Um, the previous slide was Guadalajara in Mexico. So, uh, in Alaska, um, yeah, we were undocumented and, um, I really had a hard time academically as a, as a kid, um, because of undiagnosed ADHD and a number of other sort of things going on but uh, really struggled academically for most of my childhood. Uh, my GPA was terrible. I barely graduated high school. Um, and uh, my sister, my older sister, had kind of taken the opposite route, had really dedicated herself to, to school. And she had finished with over a 4.0. She had like, you know, busted her butt for her whole four years in high school. And she got into a bunch of Ivy League schools and because we were undocumented, could not attend. And uh, it was incredibly heartbreaking and really challenging. And this was at the time, just a, a real hopeless feeling for her. Uh, the only reason she was able to attend uh, the University of Alaska Anchorage is because they did not really have their like stuff in order to like check her her uh, social security number or anything like that. And uh, yeah, it just happened to work out. She um, remarried kind of around that time. Things had gotten a little bit too late. She couldn't afford, she couldn't get financial aid. Uh, so she had married for the first time um, and sort of got her green card and uh, was able to attend uh, University of Alaska Anchorage. Heartbreaking for her. And sort of in that moment, I was, uh, I was like, why would I even try in school? Why would I even like apply myself? This is, this doesn't make any sense. Right. Uh, so I started getting in trouble and um, my mom actually remarried and I was able to sort of get my, my green card. But unfortunately, because I was getting in trouble, um, I almost got deported. Uh, there was a couple moments where I got in trouble with the law, writing graffiti, sort of drinking, doing drugs, um, all things that you should not do as a child or at all. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, I, I did not get deported, thankfully, and uh, kind of got my act together. Uh, I got kicked out of my house and was homeless for a little while um, and uh, managed to finish school uh, and work full time and 
get an apartment with a friend. And it was incredibly challenging. Um, I studied political science uh, because I really struggled to do well academically in a subject I didn't care about. So I really sort of against the advice of every single person that I talked to, it was like, why on earth would you study political science? You're never gonna get a job. Uh, I did it anyway. And I found some really amazing mentors. Uh, you can go to the next slide. At the University of Alaska Anchorage, there's some really amazing people who uh, kind of, this is the campus, um, people who kind of took me under their wing and really went to bat for me. Um, and because of them, I mean, I, I, I finished with honors uh, in my program. I um, really wanted to leave Alaska. Uh, it's a very beautiful place, but it's very dark in the winter. And that can be really challenging. So uh, you can go to the next slide. I moved to Portland, um, got a job with the state doing eligibility work for the Department of Human Services, SNAP and uh, child care and cash welfare. And that really kind of opened my eyes to what um, the scale of poverty and um, just what other people were facing as well. Despite having personal experiences with that, it really just kind of, I didn't realize how bad things were for people. And that got me really interested in policy. And so I, um, uh, you know, I was like, I, I'm going to go get a degree in, in public policy. And everyone was like, what are you doing? You're already in debt. And like, <laughs> you have a, like, what, what, like, you're just really doubling down. And uh, I did. I got a, a master's degree in public policy and uh, did a lot, you can go ahead and uh, skip to the next slide, um, at PSU, uh, did a lot of political work and community organizing um, with a number of different organizations and then sort of got really burnt out, uh, shifted to community engagement work and uh, really followed a very strange and nonlinear career path. So I'm happy to talk about the education, but if we're talking nonlinear, um, and eclectic, like I'm happy to talk about that in the professional sense too. But uh, I guess my, my big takeaway without just yammering on forever um, is that you really, like other people said, really should just make your own path. And if a bunch of people tell you uh, this is impossible or this doesn't make sense or why are you doing this or you're never getting a job, the reality is nobody really knows what uh, what we're doing. And we're all sort of making our best educated guesses uh, based on the information that we have. And uh, if you are sort of stubborn enough and lucky enough and work hard enough, uh, you can sometimes make it work. And I, I recognize that this is not the case for everybody. There's a high degree of privilege that I had uh, in being able to make sort of everything work, but I worked full time uh, throughout my educational career. It was extremely challenging. Um, but it was not sort of a everyday, you know, um, everyday path that people I think take and it can be done. It's incredibly challenging. Um, find mentors, you know, uh, get therapy, <laughs> do all of the self-care stuff that you need to. I think those are really just the biggest pieces of advice, but I'll, I'll, I'll end it there and I'll let folks, um, start with questions if that's what's next. I'll hand it back to Val, Valentina, thank you. Thank you, Raul, thank you all of our speakers. That was fantastic, um, so inspiring. And also, it's always so great. I know Raul, Jess, and Zoe personally, and I learned so much about you from literally like five minutes, amazing. Um, so before we get into audience Q&A, um, I definitely want to ask, I want to selfishly ask y'all some questions. Um, first, Zoe and Raul, sounds like you were both in a similar grad program. I, I definitely want to hear from Zoe about your path with um, your bachelor's into your master's and your graduate certificate. Can you tell us a little bit more about that and what program you were in, Zoe? Yes, absolutely. I'm sorry I didn't go on for longer. Earlier, I, I wanted to save the bulk of my chatting with you guys for this Q&A session. Um, so sorry about keeping it brief. But yes, um, <clears throat> my path through academia, I got my undergraduate in social science. And I feel like 
I went through that struggle that I think a lot of us have when we're first starting out, um, which is trying to select a major. It feels like a really intense commitment. You know, you have to stick with it for multiple years. You know, you're going to be pouring quite a bit of your financial resources into it. And we've all heard horror stories of people switching like year three and having a really tough time with having to do that. So I really wanted to be intentional in my selection. Um, I tried to pay attention to just what I was performing at the highest level with. So a lot of that was sociology, that was criminology, that was black studies, that was psychology. Um, as far as just what piqued my interest most, I love psychology classes because I'm such a people person. And so understanding, you know, what, how we can, you know, understand the inner workings of ourselves and those we interact with was fascinating to me. Um, I feel like where I really started to gain momentum and feel comfortable making that major selection was once I got to take quite a bit of sociology classes. Um, I feel like I enjoyed them because I was really getting into the thick of discussing, discussing like social issues. And so while I'm in my undergraduate, I'm learning like how to call out what I notice. Um, <clears throat> I think, you know, all of us belong to different groups and have different socioeconomic statuses. And I think that different things start to stand out about groups I don't belong to, groups I do belong to, like, so really getting good at identifying those problems. And then I knew that if I was to go and pursue a master's that I would want it to be on the solving end. So I'm thinking to myself, like, I don't think I would want to be a practitioner, even though I love psych. I knew I didn't want to be a practitioner. Um, I did really want to keep learning about sociology, but I knew that I didn't want to be a professor. And people kept making it seem like, oh, this is the linear thing that you can do with a master's in sociology. So I really just chilled on that, even though I knew it was my favorite subject, probably. And once I went to a fair, um, a like a graduate fair, like a, you know, selecting on programs. There was like a fair of all the different programs and public policy was there. And I had I honestly never considered public policy. I had heard of it and actually worked with someone at Resource Center for Students with Children that got their master's of uh, public policy, but I didn't really understand it. And so once I had the chance to talk with the current chair who was at the fair, he really just made some important connections with me once I explained like what my academic strengths and passions were. And I walked away from the fair kind of feeling like it was where sociology and political science meet. And so I felt like, okay, like if I was to go to grad school, this is what I would do it for. I felt really excited to potentially take that next step. And then COVID hit. So the end of my undergraduate was like, really lackluster I didn't get a commencement it was kind of like a tough time to stay engaged because I always took on uh, I mean in-person coursework um, <clears throat> I said in my bio that I made the decision to come to Portland State versus like a community college because I really needed to lessen that parental anxiety and make sure that my son was on campus with me because he was still under a year and so I really just wanted to really, you know, I, I was intentional at so many different bends in the journey and wanted to make sure that I did the same with my graduate programming, but lo losing that learning community and shifting to completely virtual was really tough. Um, I feel like I lost like a lot of that momentum that kept me so confident, kept me so motivated. But I was like, you know, I'm going to go out on a whim. I'm going to apply for this graduate program. And if I get in, this means that like, I am the student that I dream of being. And this means that I do have different options than just working a front desk at a medical office, which is what I was doing uh, while I was pregnant with my son and prior to having him. And it just wasn't fulfilling work for me um, because I didn't have very many hard skills. And because I was pretty young, I was like 24. Um, you know, I didn't have many like options. It was like either do like retail food service or what I was currently up to. And I knew that none of those things really enchanted me. So when my son was nearing that, that uh, 
that 11 month mark, I was just like, what, what is something radical I could do to open up my options and really challenge myself, try to find out things about myself. And so I just went out on a limb and when everything kept working, like everything I would try would work. And I would be like, oh, okay. I guess this is like what I should keep trying for. So going out on a limb and applying for a master's program, like within my family, getting an undergraduate itself was like radical. They were like, why would you do that? They, My mom actually said to me that she thought I was going to pursue my undergraduate because I didn't want to work. And I'm like, no, I'm doing it so I can work better to have better jobs like I do want to work I just don't want to do the stuff I've been up to because it's just not it's not something I feel connected to and so being able to go to school and realize that like I could lay the groundwork for my own future and do work each day that I am connected to that does make me feel like inspired empowered capable like like I'm solving some of those things that I got to talk about in my earliest academic experiences is just like the best, like it's been the best. And so <clears throat> when I pursued my master's, I also went for my graduate certificate in social innovation because someday I might want to exist in the nonprofit space or venture out into politics. Like I just really want to be equipped. And I think right now the work that I'm doing for higher education and prison program at Portland State is really just kind of the intersection of so many of my career interests and strengths. And so it just feels like, you know, when I look back to those small moments of making the choices of the major, do I go out on a limb and apply for grad school? Like everything just wound up working in my favor. And I think it was because this was the path that was meant for me. Like everything in my life got easier when I looked into higher ed like it was just easier to be a better mom easier to have more time with my kid um I shaped my school schedule so I could always have Tuesday and Thursday to spend the whole day with him uh 10 days after I started my freshman year at Portland State I was hired at the resource center for students with children because I wanted to be even more connected to my learning community and because I was a non-traditional student I knew how to I knew I had to carve out my own space for community so I'm like okay if I work here I can meet other parents my kid could make some friends I'm getting money and I'm just more connected to my learning environment so I just think I'm really glad that I did things the way that I did and it just really tells me that it was exactly what I was supposed to be up to and yeah thank you for the question Valentina wow Zoe thank you so much for sharing just your whole um, perspective of like this was the way that it was supposed to be um, reminds me of you know everybody says everything happens for a reason and every every choice you made and everything that you um, ventured out to do and took that leap led you to where you are now and I'm just I don't know as as a friend I'm very very proud of you and just so like in awe of you. Thank you so much. You're going to make me cry. Don't say anything. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, this is, yeah, I got, yeah, I'm so, so inspired by, by all three of you. And I, I really do want um, to know from, from anybody that wants to answer on the panel, um, why do you think that being a non-traditional student is stigmatized in our society? Why do you think that, you know, not going to college right after high school and then like coming back a little bit later, even if you take a gap year or two, um, it's looked down upon. How come, you know, there aren't um, enough resources to make students feel welcome who are first generation or students who are low income and students that have kids, you know, like why do you think that it's so stigmatized in our society and, and it's so pushed that students just go to a college right after high school and declare a major right away, even though they don't know yet what they're supposed to do with their life. Um, I would love to, to hear from any of you if anybody wants to answer. Um, feel free to unmute. We'll give you all a chance. I can I can answer it a little bit. Um, I I know for me, I just I just felt like that is what is expected, you know, and there's depending on, you know, depending on, you know, where you're coming from and, you know, whatever. I mean, I had a brother at the time at ASU. So like, 
So for me, I'm like, of course I'm going to go there. You know, I just, um, I also think that like the four year degree is such a like traditional thing. And whenever you have like those embedded traditions, they're so much harder to change or to see anything that could be better or different just because they've been around for so long simply. But, um, I think there, I think there's a little bit of shift and, you know, and the, the stigma personally, uh, you know, sometimes I sit in class and I'm, you know, like, oh, well, this one in this class again, oh, well, you know, don't care. <laughs> so you, you do, you have to carve out a place for yourself. And I think Zoe mentioned that before. So that's, you know, can't be afraid to break that tradition. Raul, Zoe, any thoughts? Uh, yeah, I mean, I would echo that. I think um, uh, to your question, I mean, what is the reason? I don't, I, you know, I think uh, to Jess's point, I think it's cultural. It's, um, there's uh, some financial incentives um, on the part of big institutions who are sort of, really trying to get as many people to go to schools as possible. Um, there's sort of the business aspect of it. I think there's also just the like, um, unfortunately there's like very much the uh, prestige aspect of it. And I think that uh, there's a lot of uh, unfortunate sort of belittling of people who don't get their degrees or um, decide to go to a different path that like they're somehow less than or less smart or um, which is nonsense, right? Like it's, it's just, and that often translates to hiring managers and people who do, um, you know, big decisions basically to hire people like that translates to them choosing to put a four year degree as a requirement for an entry level position. It, it sort of cascades down. So I, I do think it's systemic. I mean, it doesn't, it's not an accident, um, but I think uh, there's just a number of different sort of economic, social uh, factors at play. Uh, and I think a lot of them, I mean, race, you know, gender, a lot of that stuff also, um, racism and the patriarchy and uh, lots of other sort of systems compound to exclude people. Uh, so that's, that's my read on it. I don't know though. I mean, I haven't really <laughs> studied studied that specific uh, thing. Yeah. Yeah, I think you make a lot of good points there and curious to see if Zoe has uh, more to add. Yeah, I would say I think it's stigmatized because it's treated definitely for men as well, but I think in a, a hyper sense for women like, if you don't have it figured out by like 24, they're like, well, your ship has sailed. Like you had your chance to figure it out and you didn't. And now this is your life. Like your options have lessened and you have to just go along with like the status quo kind of. Cause I think if all of us had gone along with what people or our families or people around us were telling us like was our options, we would be up to very different things right this second. And I know that that definitely applies to me. Like I didn't have like a lot of support with that choice, especially since I had already had a kid. I feel like people were like, well, you don't get to go to school. That's for like people who don't have a kid or people who are younger than you who are still figuring it out. But I tried to just shift my thinking and not align it with the people that were wanting me to question things because I tried to just make it like a fun, like undercover experiment, if you will. Like, like Jess, how you said like, oh, I know I'm the oldest person in the room. Like I definitely had moments where I knew that, especially when I was taking like freshman inquiry, but I tried to treat it like, well, they might be younger than me, but I've been around longer. So I have more cool stuff to draw from for assignments. So it's actually a hack. Like I can write a way better paper. I can do a way better reflection or speak in front of you because I'm just like more comfortable. I have a lot of things to draw from. So I tried to just, instead of thinking about the ways that I was different, I tried to think about the ways that I could use me being around longer to my advantage instead of like 
thinking of it as a negative. I try to just think of it as a positive and just draw from my lengthier experience than my peers when I was in the same space. But once I got through that first year, I was pretty much in rooms where there were other non-traditional folks as well. And that helped me feel like more of a sense of belonging for sure. Um, but I agree with you, Raul. I think a lot of it is systemic. And I think that, I don't know. I just, I think people would have us believe that our, you know, our future is decided at a certain point. And if we haven't settled on something, that's it. You have to like work at the airport or something. And it's like, no, you can do whatever you want to do at any point in life. You don't have to, no one can just slide you into a lane. Like you still have the ultimate choice, you know? Absolutely. Thank you, Zoe. Those are all excellent, excellent insights. I think that it's many reasons as you all covered. Um, on the flip side of this question, I would love to know if there's anything that you're hopeful about the way that our societal norms are changing and evolving. Um, is there anything that you've seen, especially in, you know, your, now that you're on the professional side and just like you were in the professional side, now you're in the student side. So like you're gonna re-enter the, the workforce um, now with your degree. So like you're seeing it from many lenses. Is there anything that you're seeing that makes you hopeful? Um, do you see the stigma kind of changing and becoming less stigmatized? I do see there becoming a little less stigma and in, in fact, you know, I, I think in the more that I am in school and the more that I'm learning, the more I, I, I feel, you know, that I belong there and I don't, you know, like, like Zoe said, you, you know, you kind of, you're, you're almost, you have all that experience behind you, you know, that, that some of the other younger folks might not have, you know, you've got life experience, you've got all kinds of things to bring to the table. The number one thing that you bring is you actually care about your grades. You go to class, you want to learn. You know, when I was younger, I, you know, I didn't go to every class. I don't know about you guys, but uh, yeah. Uh, so really wanting to be there and knowing that, you know, you're, you've got to make the most with what you've got right now. You know, you this is your chance. So I, you know, I mean, I look at all of our stories. So if there's, there's a lot more stories out there like ours. So I think that gives me hope right there. Uh, Zoe or Raul, do you have any hopeful, you know, thoughts but about how things are changing? Um, sure. Yeah, I would say I see a lot more non-traditional students like really going for it. Um, <clears throat> I think at you know near the end of my time at Resource Center for Students with Children, I really started to notice like a ramp up of parents. I feel like when I first started, it was like mostly moms, and then I started to see like other parents, male parents, different family structures, like which signified to me, you know, there's a ton more tr non-traditional students and they're also bringing their family with them to campus um, and this is one of their identities that they have. I worked for a time at the College of Engineering as well prior to my role that I'm serving in now and I feel like I saw a lot of non-traditional students there as well. Um, I think it's really empowering to me even when someone is in a different field or a different profession than me if I see them just going for it, whether they're a mom or whether they're a lot older than their working peers, professional peers or academic peers. Like, I just really have a lot of respect for it. And now that I, I, th I was t telling Valentina the other day, like I know so many more non-traditional and transfer students now than I did when I was a non-traditional student myself. Um, and so I just, I think it's really cool to me that says that like, not only are more of these people going for it, but they feel like Portland State might be a welcome environment for them, their family, their goals. And I think that that's great. Um, 
those are the people that I'm really hoping to support as well. And, you know, I've mentioned that I'm working with higher education and prison program, like pretty much anyone coming from that background, justice impacted, formerly incarcerated, like they're going to also be a non-traditional student and they have a pretty unique identity as a student. And for a long time, I feel like that population wasn't welcome. Like I'm the type of person, so many people helped me get a leg up on my path that I have to pause and do that for other people. Even if we have different identities, I'm gonna slow down and take those moments to walk someone to a building or even when Valentina asked me to talk today, even if no one was here and it was just the three of us, like it would have been a pleasure because I really need to just always keep in mind like, hey, the stuff that people helped me find or exposed me to resources and services, like that's why I made it through, so. It just a lot of things are full circle for me and I try to keep the memory of starting and feeling so nervous like really close in my mind because sometimes I still feel like that. It's just about different things now. So it's important to try to help others with our same story, you know, that's really important to me. So true. So true. Raul? Yeah, I mean, I think... Zoe and Jess uh, covered covered a lot of it. I think um, the only thing that I would say differently, I mean, yeah, I, I, what Zoe was saying about the, like, bringing the ladder for people down who are coming up after you, right, like making sure that you're, you know, lending a hand when people are, are coming up next. But I think the thing that really gives me hope, and I don't know, I've at my, my in my experience with young people um, in the various roles that I've had, volunteer and professional is that one thing that really gives me a lot of hope is that it seems like young people care a whole lot less about what other people think than when I was a kid. Like it feels like that sentiment is a lot more prevalent in a good way. Like in, in a way that's like, there's this confidence and this willingness to kind of just go their own path that I think is incredibly inspiring. And I think, uh, seeing that in young people, um, gives me a lot of hope for the future because it feels like you know they 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 get that you just kind of have to do your own thing and support your community and be there for one another and that's the only way we get ahead and yeah I mean I, I do think that you know older generations and my, myself included I feel like um, we had that but it feels like it's a, a lot more prevalent now and that's very exciting so true. I think that that's something that I have seen as well is that younger younger folks um, have a completely different mentality and um, that makes me really, really hopeful. I think it also goes along with like what they're exposed to and the uh, amount of information that is shared nowadays. I think that social media platforms make um, non-traditional students, you know, like be a lot more visible and, and it makes it be more normal. Um, so yeah, I, I am, you know, really, really hopeful about um, the, this umbrella term that we're using for this event, just becoming not non-existent really, you know, in a way I was telling Zoe um, last week that we're all kind of non-traditional students and, or we all know somebody that was a non-traditional student because that's, the definition that we're using is that everybody's path, you know, from high school to college and then into the workforce is completely different. So, yeah, um, I have a lot more questions, but I definitely want to give a chance to our audience to ask questions. Um, if you have a question and you would like to ask it with your microphone, um, you can go ahead and raise your hand and then we'll call on you and you can unmute. Um, we also have enabled the Q&A feature. You can ask your question in there, or you can drop it in the chat. Um, we definitely want to hear from y'all. Um, and at this point, I usually stop sharing, and then I, I start sharing again after the Q&A, but so that way we can kind of see everybody, because this event is supposed to be a community roundtable. Um, so I'm going to stop sharing so that we can all see each other. And it looks like Sashin has her hand raised, so I'm just going to call on her first. Go ahead, Sashin. Hi, everybody. Thank you for hosting. And I'm really proud of all the panelists up here. Um, Y'all did an amazing job. And I love learning about the non-traditional student journey. I feel like most of my life, um, I was subjected to, you got to go to college and you got to go right after high school. 
and I felt really rushed. But um, just like you mentioned, wanting to possibly go to a community college first. And I was lucky enough to do that for the first two years. But I'm so grateful that that was an opportunity for me because holy crap. Uh, yeah, definitely had to ease into it. So uh, my question for the panelists would be, um, what are your future goals and how will your education like help you achieve them? Would anybody like to go on first? I will go if no one else wants to go. Um, go Zoe. <laughs> Hey, girl. Thank you for the question, Sashin, and thank you for being here. Um, I would say my future goals are extremely, extremely clear to me. Um, I've shared with you guys in this conversation today that I kind of let some other things be revealed to me. And while I was letting those things kind of marinate, reveal themselves to me, my end game became extremely clear. Um, I know that my dream job is to be a dean at a university. And I really want to build my platform with, you know, sharing details of my narrative that I've shared with you guys, um, but also really doing the work in the less attractive, less noticed pockets of higher education. And I feel like, you know, working with the student parent population for about five and a half, almost six years gave me a huge, you know, leg up on how I really want to challenge equity and what I do and don't see as far as equity within higher education. Um, that was probably the first marginalized community that I've served. I would say the second one goes a little deeper and gets more into those like fringe areas of marginalization in higher education, which is currently and formerly incarcerated students. Um, as soon as I heard of this initiative at Portland State, I knew that I had to be a part of it in some way, even if that looked like just volunteering my time. And I found out about it as I was nearing my graduation date from uh, completing my master's. And I was just like, just like amazed and I knew that like this was going to be something that could really equip me to getting to that end game which is to be a dean and I feel like I just feel like all of the ones that I've come across one you know I didn't see myself in them at all all of the ones that I've met except for one at least at Portland State have all been male um, they have all been white and none of them have been first generation students um, perhaps they were parents or had an untraditional background, but that was never shared with me. So not that they owe me to share, share that with me, but if you don't share that, I'm going to assume that you probably did have a traditional path. And so what that reveals to me is like, how come if there's so many students like Jess, Raul, myself, and other people that we know, why are those in power never reflected back to us the way that we reflect ourselves into the student body itself like I just think that that's not really a question that gets asked like there's so many times a decision could have made could have been made more inclusive more equitable if there had just been a person with one of our voices or identities in the room and so I'm just going to work as hard as I can to become that person um I was actually preparing to apply for my PhD December 2024 and put that on hold because I was asked to join the team over at uh, Higher Education in Prison, HEP is what we call it. And I feel like just those skills of like, you know, speaking to legislature, um, having to lobby, having to write port reports that will be published, manage, you know, $2.3 million grants and solicit for new ones as well. like just those skills that I don't think I could have gotten anywhere else I'm getting now. So what I'm going to do is complete the grant term here at this position and then go and do that and then just go out and serve and like really spread my wings. Um, the vision of it is so clear to me. Like I see what I'm wearing, what I'm doing, what I'm saying, how my day starts, what it means to my kids. Like I see it all and it's just, a journey that I'm really dedicated to that has meant so much to me and my family and 
yeah, I, I can't wait till we have the next conversation and I tell you guys what I'm up to. Like, that's what I'm going to do. So thank you for asking this question. Thank you, Zoe. I just want to interject real quick. Apologies for interrupting. But I love what you just said about I see what I'm wearing, what I'm doing and how my days start. And like that visualization is what we have to like hold on to. And people don't believe that we see it like we see our life. And like, those are the things that I'm working towards every single day. I love that you said that. I've never heard someone say that out loud till today. So I got that written down. My paper is on fire right now. Thanks all of y'all. <laughs> Sashin, can you say your question again so that Jess and Raul can remember what it was? Yeah. Um, my question was, what are your future goals and how will your education help you achieve it? Jess? Raul, either of you? I can, I can uh, address it. Um, you know, I'm not sure if I, if I, I can probably where you guys might have been too, uh, Raul and Zoe, but I'm now at the point where I'm debating going further with school and haven't applied, but I have it kind of just there and, you know, the back of my mind, like a little voice saying, like, do it, do it, do it, you know. But, yeah, we'll see. We'll see. Graduating in June. So see what happens after that. But, you know, I, I really enjoy working in nonprofit. And prior to that, I'd always worked with a million nonprofits, but I was always on like the other side of things. And I think I was trying to explain this to somebody at work the other day. <clears throat> so I, I always got to see like, you know, the, the big events and like the big, all the, you know, the hoo-ha about everything, but I never really got to see like what that money that was being brought in that I helped to bring in, I guess, was going towards, you know, what, so I really like being a part of that side much more. Um, I think that both sides are important, but um, I'm really enjoying like experiencing a different vantage point on it so yeah Raul do you have um an answer for Sashi's question uh it's not that exciting <laughs> I I I feel um <laughs> I feel like I'm I'm happy where I'm at I feel like I you know I I worked super hard and um, I uh, feel like I'm in a position where, um, uh, professionally and in my life where I get to help out my community, um, as like a big part of my life and focus on the relationships that are important to me. And that's like, I feel incredibly lucky and privileged to have that, um, be where I'm at. And so I feel like I made it, baby. I'm like, you know, I'm like, I'm here. I'm I'm at my professional goal. I, you know, I have, I have done management before, and I don't really. That's not really my thing. Um. Yeah, I, you know, I'm involved in my union. I'm involved in my community or uh, my um, na uh, community center in my neighborhood. I, um, you know, volunteer. I have good relationships. It's incredible. Uh, I feel incredibly lucky, and m my goal now, I guess, is to make sure that other people can do this too. <laughs> like, that's like, you know, I feel like that's the that's the biggest thing is like making sure that uh, it doesn't end with me. Um, so, yeah. Totally, I love this theme of like reciprocity. You know, whatever you receive, you also can, you know, return and. I feel like you all are giving us so much of your of your knowledge and your lived experience is inspiring. So you're already doing that. You're already, you know, doing this um, work of making sure that other people know that they're not alone. Um, that's, that's beautiful. Thank you, Raul. Um, we have another question in the chat uh, from Oregon Mesa, but I, I think it's from uh, my student employee, Abby. Um, so the, her question is, what advice would you give to students who are struggling to see the bigger picture? Do you have any tips for grounding? And I, I'm i going to let you all, you know, think about it. And then if you have a, an 
answer, Zoe, Raul, or Jess, feel free to unmute. So what advice would you give to students who are struggling to see the bigger picture? Yeah, I mean, I, I'll try and keep mine short. Uh, so uh, I think that's a great question. I think, um, I, I think we all, I think the reality is that all of us struggle sometimes to see the bigger picture. Um, it can be especially challenging if you're focused on like what you have to, you know, how, you, how you're going to pay the bills and how you're going to eat and how you're going to feed your kids. Like all of that can really make keeping the eyes on the prize like really, really hard. So um, I think recognizing that and then um, just like I think having something that grounds you in your values and like you you do what you're doing because you believe in it. Uh, I think that that is sort of the best medicine to despair is having like a good guiding light, right? Like whether that's religious or not, or whether that's like your sort of own political values or your social values or whatever you have that's sort of there to guide you. I think that's the, that's the way that I've done it. Um, and it's not, I, it, I'm not always successful, but, um, yeah, I mean, that's my, that's my, that's my stab at that answer. I would say for me, um, what helped me see the bigger picture was, you know, I'm really contrasting my previous work with the work that I get to do now. And I think in my previous work, sure, it paid the bills or, you know, kept me sustaining whatever lifestyle worked for me at that point in time. But I had to leave my professional value, I mean, my personal values at home to do that kind of work. Like, I I became so deeply disenchanted with the medical field because I was working for a specialist office and any time there would be like a person with OHP or a person who applied for scholarship or anything, it was just like, people were very vocal about like, oh, another one, especially if it was like a kid who was on OHP and it was just like grossing me out. I was just not able to really engage. I didn't want to be part of the team because I'm just like, I've heard you guys say such awful things. And what you don't realize is your, your coworker right next to you could be on OHP. That was me. I was on OHP. So I'm just like, you know, hearing the stuff that was getting said I didn't like it. I knew that I couldn't participate in work anymore that forced me to leave my personal values at home. And so getting to pursue my education and, you know, never having to be forced to do that as a student was super empowering. And then learning the ways that I could build up my confidence to where I would know how to do that same thing in the workspace was really important to me. And then once you get a taste of being able to do work where you don't have to do that, you can't go back. Like I literally couldn't go back to being, I would, I would get fired the first day, like one rant and I'm out of there. Like I'm just that type of person. Like if I notice something going on in the moment, I'm hopping into a rant. I'm going to like break it down. I'm not going to disrespect anyone, but I'm going to be like, for this reason, like hard stop. And if that makes you want to fire me, it's all good. If that makes you not want to be my friend or not want to collaborate with me, it's all good. And like, I just never had the agency to be able to say that before so you can't go back once you do that like you really can't and I think um, the bigger fi the bigger picture for me was being able to bring my values to work be the same person that I get to be at home uh, as I get to be at work or in my learning community and I just that's worth every sacrifice I would say sometimes when I'm having a hard time like getting a student on the same page as me or to feel as enthusiastic about exploring the stuff that we're saying we explored like I just try to really get the right messaging for that person in front of them sometimes you only have a quick 10 minutes but I try to really be expedient in me knowing what messaging needs to get in front of that person to where they do consider pursuing higher education um even if that involves, hey, I have to bring out some stuff from my own narrative, like, hey, you might have tried college before, you might have not did well in high school, like, I try to, you know, I don't ever want to make it sound like a pitch, but I think it is appropriate when you're trying to make it make sense to someone, especially if they had 
some of the same life options as us at first, you know, to say like, hey, not trying to pressure you or anything, but I, I've been in your same shoes. And like, I think even just the exercise of having to like stay down to come up for something for that long. Like I was in school a total of seven years with no breaks, but I got three degrees. <clears throat> like I had a, another kid while I was in grad school. Like you can just do so much more and tap into your life in so many different ways than you would be able to if you were just up to the professional grind. I think going to school helped me slow down and like look around more, be more appreciative of things. Um, I have like a deeper sense of like what resolve is, resiliency, like persistence, like I can go through anything now. If I can stay down to come up for seven years and it worked, I'm like, what? Anything is possible, it's worth it. Like. I just really try to reach people from the angle that they need to be reached. But at the end of the day, if you can't reach them any other way, education and pursuing your education is an avenue to wealth. And it worked for me. And I'm not even wealthy yet, but it changed my trajectory. Like, it made it so everything that I wanted to do and needed to do was possible. So if nothing else works, that messaging is really effective. And I try to tell people, like, even while you're a student, I can show you things that you can get involved in and pursue along the way that can help you do better than any job you can find right now. Like personal challenge, I will slow down and figure it out with you, um, especially if it's a student that I'm working with. So, you know, all of that equaled the bigger picture for me and to just like have completed it. I just proved so many things to myself. And even if nothing else came from it other than that, it would make it all worth it. So. That's the bigger picture for me, yeah. Love it. Um, Jess, do you want to answer this question of what advice would you give to students who are struggling to see the bigger picture? Any tips for grounding? Um, I know, I know for me it's, you know, to it's humbling, but to feel okay with admitting that you don't know something, you know, and be willing to ask for help, you know, with, from other students, maybe from a mentor, you know, from your instructors, like I know, you know, back at my first go around at, you know, college, I never dreamed of going to my instructor's office hours, you know, but now I'm like in office hours all the time, you know, so I would say like, take advantage of all the resources that are available to you. Um, there's so many, you know, you can, I mean, I get emails all the time about, you know, help that's offered here and there. And I know for me, there's, I my one of my challenges is, you know, I'm not as technologically advanced as some of the younger folks. And I just have to own it and admit it, you know, and then maybe I can get some help or I just admit that I don't know how to do that. And Sarah knows that at Mesa. So, you know, I've had to learn to not be afraid to, you know, say that I don't know something. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think there shouldn't be any shame in, um, you know, being humble. I think it's a totally um, a virtue and, I, I am so inspired by all of you. I think you all actually are like making me go back to school now. And, um, you know, you're making me think, is it too late to, for me to go and get my master's degree? Like now you're, you're influencing me. Um, but we have another question in the chat, which is how were you all able to finance your education? And, you know, answer this if you're comfortable, but um, give us the cliff notes if you'd like. I'm, I'm comfortable answering this because I'm really proud of the strategies I learned um, in this time. So I definitely had to utilize financial aid um, <clears throat> due to my age and living on my own and having a family of my own. I wasn't able to factor in my parents' income, which was probably for the best anyway. Um, and I did have a pretty high amount of, uh, of need. 
just because at the time of applying, I was a newer parent and I wasn't working. But like I said, after I, uh, so I was pretty much all financial aid. And then, like I said, 10 days after starting my freshman year, I was able to secure an on-campus job, which made it so each time I would get a disbursement of aid, it would automatically take care of my tuition. And then I would usually have a remaining maybe like 2200 left over and I would try to pay as many bills as I could three times on the first day that I got my financial aid so like three phone bills were would get paid um any other routine bill that I had I would pay it three times and you know it sucked because you would see this big balance come through and you'd be like "Ooh, play money and it's like no handle what you need to in the now on the very first day so that when you get your paychecks that's the play money because you already handled all the necessities so it just taught me how to be like more patient how to um, maneuver with less like cash flow at any given time but I always could feel that sense of calm and anxiety because I knew I handled paying my rent paying all of my family necessities um I unfortunately even despite all of the identities and intersectionality and yada yada I'm describing with you guys I never got a scholarship in my whole time at PSU which is nuts um would have loved to would have made a big difference for me but I just wasn't able to secure one I tried a few times and then just kind of stopped because I didn't think that I was going to really be able to write anything different or say anything more compelling than I had already said. Um, grad school was definitely a different animal. I feel like I wasn't prepared for the price hike. Like there was no opportunity to do that three times anything. Like I couldn't even really do it once. Um, <clears throat> and even with getting the maximum amount of aid and some additional like unsubsidized, subsidized stuff, I still needed some more help. So I decided to try to be a GA. And I did that three times while I was a grad student. And that was the way that I was able to pay my tuition, but also keep, uh, keep elevating my career status and really keeping my resume exciting to future employers. Um, my first, my first GA ship was with Build Exito, which was awesome. My second one was with government relations over in the, uh, at, at the time it was President Percy's office. So that was a really great experience. Yes, GA grad assistant. Yeah, um, that was a really great experience because at that point I already knew that I wanted to work in public policy. So I'm working in an office of government relations, getting like a ton of input that I don't think my fellow cohort members were getting access to some pretty exciting projects and things that I could do my 509 around. And it was just great. It just kept me really engaged. And then the final one that I did, um, Resource Center for Students with Children, because I had worked there for so long, wanted to support me in my very last go around with my tuition. And so they created a GA ship for me. And that really just capped it off. And yeah, I was able to be financially secure in that time. Um, after having my daughter, I had to do my 509. So I was working at Resource Center as a GA. I was doing my internship for my 509 and I was a full-time student. And that was a pretty tough time, but it was just what I had to do to keep everything moving properly in my household. But um, again, like it just really taught me some really great things about time management and that I can stick anything out. And I'm, I'm I'm thankful with the way that it went. It was hard in the time, but I'm thankful for how it went, definitely. Um, Jess and Raul, would, would you like to share? You, you don't have to if you don't want to. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I can share for myself. When I first came over from PCC, I had heard about this. I'm not sure if it advisor told me I just heard of it, um, the transfers finished free program. So, you know, I filled out, you know, did the FAFSA and filled out all the paperwork for that. Really kind of only to find out at the last minute that I, you have to make really almost nothing to be eligible for that. So I 
I wasn't eligible for that, but in turn, it kind of helped me get um, my financial aid. So uh, I ended up getting financial aid. Um, I got a few little scholarships as well at PCC, which did help, but yeah, mainly my, my uh, time here at PSU is all financial aid. And of course, um, making sacrifices at home, which I'm sure we're all familiar with. And, and my wonderful husband working a ton, you know, to help me while I'm studying. And so it's just been, yeah, I've been pretty blessed that, uh, that I've been able to have this opportunity really. Um, my undergrad, I mean, both, both situations were kind of a mess for me. Um, my undergrad, because, uh, uh, of a rule that still exists where if you are under 26, uh, if you are not legally emancipated and you do not have children, um, you have to fill out the FAFSA with your parents' information. I was estranged from my mom and, uh, she refused to sort of provide any information. So I was actually not eligible for any financial aid because I didn't fill out the FAFSA, uh, could not fill out the FAFSA. Uh, when I finally did that in my junior year in undergrad, um, at that point, uh, my mom was doing pretty well. Um, and uh, I didn't qualify for any of the sort of uh, financial assistance that I could have gotten despite sort of not getting any support, any financial support from my family. Um, so uh, that was pretty rough. And that meant that I had to work full time, um, both in my undergrad and in my graduate program and take on a lot of student loans. Um, and as a result, um, I have a lot of student loan debt, um, which I'm still working it off. And, um, that I think is possibly the biggest piece of advice that I would give to folks is if you can avoid it, uh, don't do it uh, or do it as least as possible. You know, um, I think it's, 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 it's really, it's really hard, especially when you need it, right? Like, which in my case and other people's cases, it was like, I needed it to sort of make ends meet and be able to be a student. But um yeah, it was a it was a real tragic sort of uh, learning of my first exposure to bureaucracy and trying to uh, call dozens of people and be like, hey, I know I'm not 26, but I am completely financially independent. Don't get anything from my parents. And they're like, sorry. Um, so uh, that was that was a bit rough. Um, but yeah, um, that's the that's the that's the answer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I think a lot of people end up being in that position and um, it's rough. Like Zoe said, we need student loan, that forgiveness. It's such a barrier. Um, and it's also so crazy that you're expected to make a decision like accepting thousands and thousands of dollars in loans when you're, you know, 18 or even any time in your early twenties. Um, it's, yeah, I, I just can't, I look back myself and it's baffling to me. And I also wish that I had known more resources available when Zoe mentioned that she didn't get any scholarships. It's like, come on, like <laughs> she's exactly the type of person that you would, you know, expect to, uh, for a scholarship committee to pick. And it's still either there's not enough scholarships or the, the resources to like be able to, um, you know, write your essay and have somebody read it are not there. And, um, even just getting the word out that there are scholarships available, sometimes those um, resources or those methods don't necessarily work. So yeah, I, um, I want to be mindful of time. It is 6.52 and we always finish off Mesa Talks with a call to action. So before I go into you know, sending the or putting the feedback form in the chat, um, which I think our Oregon Mesa co-hosts will do. Um, I'm going to quickly um, shout out again that we do have a, well, I'm gonna start sharing my screen because I have, uh, I have slides for this. So 
I want to first quickly shout out um, this link tree that we have for resources to support Indigenous Oregonians. I mentioned in our land acknowledgement at the top of the event that we, we have this link tree in place because a lot of the time uh, land acknowledgements are all talk and no doing. So we definitely want to continue that work and, and uplift the future of Native Oregonians. So we have a bunch of links in there and in the feedback form, if you have more links that we can add, I would absolutely love to see them. Um, and the other thing I want to really quickly shout out is that our upcoming competition or I guess signature event Mesa Day is coming up on Friday, May 17th and our volunteer form just went live today. So if you're interested in volunteering at Mesa Day, um, that link is being shared in the chat right now. And also very quickly, want to again ask you all if you wouldn't mind spending literally two to three minutes of your time to give us some feedback. Um, let us know how we did so we can improve on future events. And we have this form available in an English and a Spanish version. And from all the entries, I'm going to take a um, winner and I'm going to, uh, it's going to be a raffle and I'm going to mail you a $25 gift card to Bastini Pastoria. So if you're interested in winning that, please fill out the feedback form. We have six minutes left. So I really want to make sure that we give each of our speakers a chance to do their call to action. And the way that we frame call to actions is either who else do you see doing important work in this space slash what is some advice that you would give to high school students and recent Mesa alumni who are non-traditional students themselves? If they're listening right now, what advice would you give them, you know, at the point of their life that they are right now? I would say the advice I would give to a recent graduate student or a student that's about to graduate or has recently graduated would be to really just never decide that it's too late for you to restructure everything in your life. I feel like it's probably the bravest thing you can do. I think that, like we said, like people will tell you that at a certain point in your life, you've decided things and that's your life and that's it. I would just really say never feel locked into that and be willing to just go out and try something new it doesn't even have to be academia it could be trade school like switching careers it could be anything yeah. but i think that like if we let people tell us that our options are up then you know all your growth is done and i don't think that life works that way so i just would challenge anyone to try to do something radical to better their life or better connect with the things that they spend their time doing which is you know work um, that would be my advice. Jess or Raul? I can comment. Okay. Um, I, I mean, I would say for me, it was definitely like getting myself to go to that orientation. You know, it, um, it was, I, you know, I was kind of already going to PCC, you know, taking courses and stuff, but, it, but I didn't have like a full direction or did I know that it was possible until I went to the orientation and within, within that, they would pair you off with an advisor and, you know, there were financial aid tables and, you know, all kinds of information that you can gain from that. And just, you know, walking around campus and getting a tour and like spending time there talking to other students um, I, that really helped me a lot. And, and I kind of was at that point where, you know, I, I couldn't see like, is it going to take me, like I mentioned, you know, in my talk, I didn't, I thought maybe I had lost all my credits, you know, I, cause it had been so long and, and the actuality is I, I hadn't really lost that much. And so I, that kind of opened up my eyes that it was a possibility for me and some other older students out there might not necessarily know that or you know um that you kind of keep keep that stuff with you you know it doesn't just magically disappear um yeah so I mean my shout out is to the advisors at PSU because 
they helped helped me a ton and um you know they just I feel like they're really available to the students and you know they they seem like they can just punch it in so quickly when you just look at it and to me it's like a jumbled mess you know but they they know exactly what goes where and how to get there so yeah that's what helped me exactly look at you now Raul do you want to take us home with your call to action yeah um I think uh the advice that I would give um Mesa, Mesa high schoolers or graduate a recent graduate um who are non-traditional students is that um, you might be the first person to do it. That doesn't mean it can't be done. Um, and it's going to be hard and the cards are stacked against you and you still can do it. Uh, it's gonna be hard. And, um, you know, um, yeah. Um, I believe in you. <laughs> I guess that's my advice. <laughs> and I think that is so true. I think that often what you need is for one person to say, I believe in you. So I know that's cheesy, but it's the truth. And I, I'm going to read this uh, comment in the chat. Thank you so much, everyone. You're all so inspiring. I love hearing from each of you. There are so many paths to take, and all of them are the right one. I think that's a beautiful beautiful place to leave it. It is 701. Um, thank you so much to everybody for joining us. Thank you to our three panelists, Raul, Jess, and Zoe. You all were incredible and we're so grateful um, to have you join us and have you as part of the Mesa community. So yeah, thank you all and have a good rest of your night and we hope to see you at the next Mesa event. Bye. Bye everyone. Thank you for coming. <clears throat> thank you everyone.